Well, it's Father's Day, and I tried to find the best source of fatherhood that I could, thinking through all the psychologists I know, and working it through, I couldn't come up with anybody better than Bill Cosby. J just a perfect case. Actually, it's, it's Bill Cosby's father. So in memory of this, uh, just talking about how Bill Cosby remembered his father, he said, you know, if I asked my dad for a nickel, I had to hear his life story how he ate dirt to get by. He had to hear about his dad, how he walked to school 4 o'clock every morning with no shoes on, uphill, both ways, five feet of snow, and he was thankful, by golly. He once killed a grizzly bear with his loose-leaf notebook. <laughs> and as Bill talks now, when his parents come to visit their grandchildren, they hand out money to the kids left and right as much as they can. And Bill is just aghast what it took just to get a nickel out of his dad when he was little. And Bill has to speak up. He tries to enlighten the situation and explain to his children that these are not the same people that he grew up with. These are old people who are trying to get into heaven now. <laughs> Well, our fathers try to give us advice, and direction is the main thing. Fathers try to tell us, this is who you are. Well, you need to live up to this and realize your call. Well, in that regard, Jesus is a bit of a father, giving us fatherly advice. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. This is how you shall live your life. You've heard it said, and this is what you've heard from years back. But Jesus says, I'm here now. A new age has begun. Christianity has begun. You are Christian people. And this is what it means. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about, how to be a Christian. Well, today we're looking at another segment of this. Last week we talked about the Beatitudes, living the blessed life. This is a response to that. This is what it means, living the blessed life. Jesus says, Matthew 5, beginning at verse 13, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And may God add power to the reading of this word, that it takes on new life to us today, that though we may have heard these words before, that this morning they might truly connect with our heart in a special way. Jesus talks about living the Christian life. It's a matter of living a life that's natural, a life that's every day, a life that involves Christianity from Monday through Friday and Saturday also, not just simply on Sunday. I've talked to so many have that attitude of, of their Christian life. On Sunday morning, you betcha I'm a Christian. I'm in church, and I live the Christian life until noon. And you get to, the Christmas, and, uh, get to the Sunday dinner, and then we see what happens after that. When I watch the Diamondbacks on TV, sometimes my faith suffers through that experience, but do what we can. But Jesus calls us to live the Christian life every day, all the time, to let it be a complete lifestyle. Your whole life. I found it very disturbing. I remember one of my seminary professors was preaching during chapel time. And he said, you know, Jesus responds to us so often by the way we respond to him. If we give ourselves completely to him, boy, that power is there even in greater strides. But if we compartmentalize it and say, God, I'll be paying attention to you on this day, but not this day and maybe that day. He said, don't be too surprised that things might show itself in a way you don't expect on Judgment Day. If you keep Jesus in this pocket and the rest of your life over in this pocket, and you stand before God and God says, let me see. Yeah, I want to talk to you about salvation. Let me dip into this pocket and then let me see if I've got anything in this pocket about how you may have responded to me. It's Monday through Friday. It's all the time being a Christian. Sometimes we try to make it up so great that it's such a hard thing to ascend to. But it's part of our everyday life to live the Christian life. Now that doesn't mean perfect. perfect. That doesn't mean to be a Pharisee. That doesn't mean to be a hypocrite and put on a show all the time. But to do the best that we can. One of my favorite bumper stickers that I've seen is said it this way. Christians 
are not perfect. They're just forgiven. <laughs> really good theology right there. But somehow we try to get it into our life that we're supposed to be perfect. Christians aren't supposed to make any mistakes. Oh, what a lie that is. We make plenty of mistakes. The question is how we respond to those mistakes. Do we let them defeat us or do we move on? Jesus gives us a high calling. He said, I need you in this world. Jesus is saying, I need you. You're salt. You've got to be the salt of this planet to make a difference here. Salt. What does that mean? It means different things to us today. Back in Jesus' day, it had two big uses that were so pivotal in ancient times. The first was naturally seasoning. If you had salt, you could season your food. You get fish out of the sea, you can season it up a little bit. I wonder if Jesus were to teach today what things he might choose. If he might say, you are the Lowry seasoning salt. If he might, maybe that'd be the image he used today. Or you are the red hot chili peppers that, that really spice up a dinner. But salt was the message in his age that made the difference for people. Got the image. When you got bland food, you want to put a little salt on it to liven it up. I remember my days in college eating in the cafeteria. There was one thing that always saved us, ketchup. <laughs> if it was a pretty bland meal, just hand me that ketchup bottle. We can do miracles with that. Maybe he'd say, you're the ketchup of the world. But you're the salt. You're the seasoning. You're the seasoning that spices up things to help the world get past its bland boredom and to find real life. Well, another thing a salt did in Jesus' time was a preservative. They didn't have refrigerators back then. They had to have a way to preserve it. When fishermen would catch fish up at the Sea of Galilee, it was a three-day journey down to Jerusalem. If you just took those fish and put them in the back of your wagon and headed out to Jerusalem, I guarantee you it would not be a pretty sight. But they would take the fish and put them in boxes, pour salt on, and the salt would preserve them. So they can get down to the city and sell those at great prices. Food preservative. You preserve the world how Jesus might use that today. When I was back in the restaurant business, and David, you can probably vouch for me with this, try to keep some of those things a secret. There's just things you don't want to know. But with restaurants, amen? <laughs> we just let those things go. Fresh fruit. I always thought that was good to eat fresh fruit in a restaurant until I realized how often I would order fresh fruit. It came in a big five-gallon pail, and I'd order it once every two months. Now, that's preservatives. <laughs> they doused that with preservatives. My personal theory is that funeral directors were behind that, and they're trying to get those preservatives into us. When we die, it doesn't take as much work to finish up the process for us. So. <laughs> but preservatives, how to preserve the food, how to preserve the world, to give it life, to give it meaning. Jesus had a great statement in the Gospel of John, for God so loved the world. He didn't say, for God so loved the church <laughs> that he gave his one and only son. For God so loved the world. All of these people, all these crazy people, God loves each and every one of us so much that he's trying to find a way to bring salvation. And he finds it through his people, you and me, said you are involved in this process to be the salt, to be the light to be the preservers, to be the seasoning, to bring that life-giving force into our world. That's what church life is supposed to be. In elders' meetings, we've been talking about our mission statement and our purpose as a church and what that means. And we've had some good discussions about church life. What does it mean to, to be a church, really? Not just what we've assumed or presumed, but what is a church? We've had different responses, good discussions. I appreciate it. One of the great ones was a refuge. It's a place of escape. You can come to church and get away from things for a while. Get your soul built back up. Sometimes the church is a hospital. We can come in with a wounded soul and a wounded spirit, and there's plenty of those wounded souls out there. To be able to come in and find some safety here, to get some healing. The church is a mission outpost. We are representing the kingdom of God here, and we need to be responsible with this image, this call. To do that for people that are seeking. One thing we're not is a social club. Where we're just simply an exclusive kind of a meeting here. Where we meet and if you want to come, 
well, we'll tolerate you, but if you could just sit in the less than prime seating, we'd appreciate that. No, we are the moral fabric of this world, reaching out to a world that needs to know that God loves them very much. There's a great article this morning I found on the internet. I always get my news on the websites because I don't want too much information. Just the headlines will do. But this headline got my attention. I had to read the whole thing. It was written by Alex Amaya, who's a pastor in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And he, this was the article. You may have read the title. I challenge you to look it up. Jesus Hates Religion. Oh, that hooked me. Yeah, okay, let's, let's read that one. What have you got to say there? And I appreciate his points. Jesus hates that staleness, the social club, church kind of a thing. Where it's exclusive, where people may or may not be accepted or tolerated. Jesus hates that kind of lifestyle. He hates that kind of church. That's not what he established. That's not what he did by giving his life on behalf of humanity. He reaches for more. What Hemiah is trying to bring out there is the staleness, the ruts we get into, where our faith becomes so boring it becomes so unresponsive. It becomes so stale and so lost. Jesus is looking for church to be so much more. That hospital, that refuge, that place of care where we come in and we find that relief we need. We find that acceptance and love. Jesus said it so well in John 13. How people will know you're authentic, here's the only way it's going to work. John 13, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another, if you show love and care for each other, people are going to look at that and they're going to say, wow, I don't find that anywhere else. I don't find that at work. I don't find that in the nightclubs. I don't find that in bars or social clubs. You people really care for each other. You really do love each other. And that is impressive. When I was working on my doctorate at Eden Seminary in St. Louis, very ecumenical school, I found that exciting, really. You go to class, and in your class, you'd have just about everybody represented you could imagine. We had a couple rabbis there, a number of Catholics, Episcopalians, Lutherans. They were all there. Very lively discussions. And we would get into it. I love that, too, about postgraduate studies. You weren't supposed to be shy. You put your words out there, and you fought for it. You had good argument, good debate. Never heated, never mean, but just talking about theological concepts, how you would learn. And something the rabbis said that impressed all of us. They said, you know, it's amazing the way you Christians go about it. And I was braced. I was ready for a big argument here. And he goes, no, no, really. You guys disagree with each other. And you let your disagreements be known. And then just real quick, right after that, you make it clear that you're still brothers and sisters together. That you're still united. That just because you disagree on a theological point... That doesn't mean you're not connected. You're still part of God's family and you're all connected together. And the rabbi didn't say it. I wanted him to say it. I almost said it for him. And how does it work where you're from? <laughs> when you guys disagree, what happens there? But I didn't want to get into the Middle East debate and so forth. But he said that was a miracle to them. They said they were so amazed. You could disagree and you could still love each other. And you could still get along and still appreciate what each other had to say. That's impressive. It's the love that really does it. Doctrine's important. All these other things are important, but the love is what is truly prevalent and truly makes an impact. Just as you're the salt, you're the light, you're the seasoning, you're what draws people into the kingdom of God. You're the ones that make a difference in people's light. How are you doing as a light? Are you making it shine? Are people seeing Jesus in your lifestyle? Are they responding in what you were doing, in what you were saying? I like the story that, that happened. Uh, there was a railroad man that had a job of having his lantern ready at night. There was problems they were having on the rail line, and he had to signal the light and signal trains as they came to slow down and go very slow and careful while they're working on the railroad's line. And one night a railroad or a train came through and just barreled right through and went off the tracks and into a ditch, a great wreck. Nobody was killed, but it cost a lot of money to take care of all this. And they brought it up for trial. And the railroad man was brought in and had to stand before the judge. And so they need to ask you some questions. You are under oath. You have to answer honestly. 
Were you on duty on the night that the train had the accident? And the railroad man said, yes, sir, I was. The judge said, did you have your lamp with you? The man said, yes, sir, I did. And did you wave your lamp to the train as it approached? And the man replied, yes, sir, I did. And so the judge decided that the man was not held responsible. He was able to go free to go home. And on the way home, he talked to his friend afterward and he said, boy, I sure am glad that that judge did not ask me if my lamp was actually turned on. <laughs> we got to do more than just simply have a lamp. We got to get it turned on. Let it shine. Let people see that there is another way that they can live their life. As Jesus says, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. In the Gospel of Mark, he says it there, or put it under your bed. What a silly image that is. Let me get this light turned on here and then immediately take it down and hide it. What's the point of that? Now, we've got to make our faith known to the world. But again, not a, not a high level of so such rigid demand that nobody's drawn to this, but a lifestyle that reaches people's hearts where people can say, that's what I need. I need some of that steadiness. I need that acceptance. I need to be loved just as I am, not with fear, not measuring up, but an authentic life, an authentic faith where I realize Jesus is in my life and I realize with other people that I'm learning as I go along. I'm not perfect. I'm learning to be forgiven. I'm learning to serve the best that I can. But if you want a church like that, it starts with all of us being the Christian now, not someday, not we will be, but you are the salt. You are the light right now. And to express that love to one another, let it be an authentic faith. And that's what matters. I was very moved by this letter I, I found from Joe Aldrich. And he shared it in a publication. So this is a letter I received about trying to live an authentic lifestyle and not being up there somewhere, but being down to earth and letting others know I'm trying. Joe Aldridge has reached a lot of people and he had a convert write him this letter some years later. When we met, I began to discover a new vulnerability, a warmth, and a lack of pretense that impressed me. I saw in you a thriving spirit, no sign of internal stagnation anywhere. I could tell you were a growing person and I liked that. I saw you had strong self-esteem, not based on the fluff of self-help books, but on something a whole lot deeper. I saw that you lived by convictions and priorities and not just by convenience, self-pleasure, and financial gain. And I had never met anybody like that before. I felt a depth of love and concern as you listened to me and did not judge me. You tried to understand me. You sympathized. You celebrated with me. You demonstrated kindness and generosity and not just to me, but to other people as well. And you stood for something. You were willing to go against the grain of society and follow what you believed to be true. No matter what people said, no matter how much it cost you, and for those reasons and a whole host of others, I found myself really wanting what you had. Now that I've become a Christian, I want to tell you I'm grateful beyond words for how you lived out your Christian life in front of me. Wouldn't it be wonderful to receive a letter like that someday? He said, I really learned about Christ by watching you, by your influence upon me. How wonderful that is. And what it takes is just today, starting to live the life, starting to care, starting to love one another, starting to reach out and make that difference in the lives of others.